But now they're disputing over computers and how they were programmed and what they could do in a national election. Isn't that cool? Those paper ballots are looking better to me all the time. I had a young man who came in to ask me for some advice about what he might go into with the rest of his life. And we talked about it in a couple of sessions. And then I said, I'll tell you what, I've got a friend that runs a service for helping people get jobs. And the first thing he does is try to determine what kind of job that they're suited for, which is what we've been discussing anyway. Why don't you go to him? He'll have you take a preference test. And when you're through with the preference test, he'll have a good idea of what to do with it. So he did that. And when he went back for the results of the test, the information they gave was his best possible occupation for life was motherhood. He lost faith immediately in the counseling and dropped it. You see, the computer was programmed wrong. That can happen. Make no mistake about it. That can happen. Every man, and especially Christians, though, have the capability of programming this computer, our brain, in the right way. That's what our text is about. It's about getting your programming right. In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it says that you can choose to be being filled with the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We are to be, by choice, Spirit-filled. We then think and react in situations more like God would like than like we would like. In 2 Corinthians 2.16, it says, You have the mind of Christ. At the same time, it says that in Philippians 2.5, it tells us that we are to have this attitude in ourselves. See, this is a choice. You can choose to have this attitude in yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus. And he surrendered himself and willingly laid down his life. A cross is the cost. That's the attitude of Jesus. And that should be the attitude for every one of us. It doesn't seem like it carries to the church of today. We must focus our mind on our choice. We're going to be bombarded by stimuli all about us. This passage points out the choice. It says that we are to think on these things. And he names them. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Think on these things. The idea in the Greek is actually take inventory of these things that you should have working in your life. The idea in the Greek is very clear. We should direct our attention to these things. Let your mind dwell on these things. Don't miss that. That's an excellent translation. We have control then over our thought life. Satan wants to short circuit that. That's what he's about. He wants to short circuit that. He will use other Christians. He will use friends. He will use spouses. He will use neighbors. He will use anyone and anything that he can to hurt us in our relationship to God. Satan wants to short circuit us. He wants us to dwell on lust. He wants us to feel picked on and think of revenge. He wants us angry and focusing on that anger. He wants us discouraged by circumstances. He wants us to be filled with pride and blame others for everything. Satan wants us controlled by our fears. Best tool he's got. Best tool he's got because it's the dead opposite of the faith that Jesus said we need to operate on. He wants us jealous. You can go on and on. The devil can divert our thinking so we dwell on lust and pride and prejudice and fears and hurts and the personal weaknesses and faults of others and on possessions to be had and fear of the future. Fear of the future. Never forget that. 
He can, through those things, control us. So God gives us a list. And he says, this is the list. Let your mind take inventory constantly of these things, and you will have the life that you need to live. The mind of Christ is what we need. We have that in us. We have the Spirit to fill us. In Luke, I believe it's 13, 11, or it's 11, 13. Sometimes I'm dyslexic with scriptures. But he says that if you ask, the Father will give the Spirit to those who requested it. If you just ask Him, God wants to give you the Spirit. So ask and begin to fill your life with the Spirit. This will focus us. We need, this says, first of all, to be focused on truth. On truth. Now, Jesus said this in uh, John 8, verses 31 and 32. If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Got that? We've heard that. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And that's always two politicians debating, and neither one of them had a good handle on it. This says the truth comes from the Word of God. The truth must come from the Word of God. Abide in my word, then you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We need that truth. Many who profess to be Christians have a lim limited understanding of God's Word, and consequently they have a limited hold on what the truth is. And they're easily led astray. The church at Laodicea had this kind of a problem. In Revelation, the third chapter, Jesus was speaking of the church. And frankly, they had no real convictions. That's what he's saying. No real convictions. They had a I couldn't care less kind of an attitude generally. They were neither hot nor cold, Jesus said. But because you are lukewarm, you make me sick. And I will spew you out of my mouth. You make me want to throw up, Jesus said, anything. You see, people, we have to get a handle on the truth. We have to have real convictions. We have to be hot for Jesus. Or you just might as well be cold, because lukewarm doesn't leave you as much else than left over from a throw up. The Lord said that they were ignoring the truth that God had given. They were exchanging what was physical for what was spiritual that they should have been clinging to. We must not depart from God's truth. We must buy the truth. And that's what Jesus said. He said, pay the price. Invest yourself in the truth. The truth will cost you something. It always has. We have evaluated our spiritual condition. What is it like? Discipleship is costly. It is inconvenience. It is expense. It is sacrifice. It is doing the thing that you fear to do. It is facing even death for Jesus. How many of us are willing to do that? How many of us? The disciple stands for the truth and lives out the truth. It is never a risk-free thing. We need to make sure that we have a way of life that is the truth. And without that way of life, we'll fail. We need a holistic idea of what God wants in the way of truth. Tolstoy told a, a little parable about a hungry peasant. He bought a roll and he ate it, and he was still hungry. So he bought another roll and ate it, and he was still hungry. And he bought a third roll and ate it, and he was still hungry. So he bought a pretzel, and he ate the pretzel, and he wasn't hungry anymore. And he said, stupid me, I should have bought the pretzel in the first place. <laughs> you see, folks, it's not this little part, or this little part, or this little part, or this little part that makes the meal for us from the Word of God. It's the whole thing. And we have to holistically look at the Word of God, and then the whole truth will satisfy God. And the whole truth will bless us. Truth must be a way of life. 
We must be telling the truth. We must be living the truth. Truth is number one on our agenda so that we can be God's children as he wants. Truth. Now, let's look at the next thing. He says to focus on what's honorable. Honorable. What is worthy of respect could be a translation. Honorable. Noble. There's a look up in this, isn't there? It's looking for that which is higher. Things above what the world looks at. Our view of life is supposed to be on what is honorable and doing the honorable thing. It means we're careful what we say about others. We're careful what we do about others. We're careful to do the honorable thing. This is what is noble, if you please. We need to see things in that light. John the Baptist had people come through and said, what, what are we supposed to be doing? In Luke, the third chapter, he answered them. He said, all of you need to be giving to the poor. And then <laughs> he said, now, this is going to be hard for some of you, but some of you are tax collectors. Don't take more than you're entitled to take. And then he said to the soldiers, he said, soldiers, don't abuse your power. You see, we're given things, and we're giving them to work on a noble level. We're giving them to work on a level that is above just everything on this earth. Excuse me. I am, I am hate fever driven and allergy prone. So this is my problem at the moment. Sorry about that. We must then view life as doing what is honorable. When we talk about marriage, 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 3 talks about it. Hebrews 13, 4 said, let the marriage bed be pure, honorable, held as honorable. We take the high road into personal relationships. We forgive. We don't condescend. We do not gossip. We do not complain. We do not speak against another. We're willing to go a second mile with anyone. We're willing to put self aside and humbly serve without thought of what we're going to get out of whatever it is that we're doing. In area we lift up our in every area we lift up our vision above the world. The things that are worthy of respect. That means we pick our heroes carefully. It's gotten so that we're in danger in our society of having all heroes who are villains, creeps, or cretins. We must not do that. <coughs> we must not. We need to direct our kids to real people who are honorable and worthy of respect. And the best possible person to direct them to is Jesus. The best person for us to be directed to is Jesus. We can subconsciously develop negative images, though, if we're not careful. If you get to looking at somebody, like a child, focuses on his parents and says, I will never do that. I will never be that way. And you know what he'll do? He'll focus on that never so long and so hard that he will begin becoming his parent, whom he despised. And guess what he gets for change? He gets counseling sessions because he's been hurting himself with that the whole time. We must look at the higher things. Lift your sights to the honorable. Let's reflect on those things. Be part of the kingdom of God. Be serving as part of the kingdom of God. Be his child. Fully. Holy. <laughs> there, there was a fellow named Nolan who was selling tickets for a church benefit. He said to his friend, would you, would you want to buy one of these? And he said, no, 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 I can't buy one. can't buy one. Won't be able to attend, but I'll be with you in spirit. And he turned to him and said, I have $2, $3, and $5 tickets. Where would you like your spirit to sit? <laughs> I think that might be a good answer for folks at some point in time. Might be something worthy to, to think about. We, if we're going to be there in spirit, need to be there as much as we possibly can. Take inventory of what's honorable. And what is honorable 
is not to forsake our assembling together, but to encourage one another day by day, as long as it's called today. Righteousness. Righteousness. Whatever is in agreement with God's law. First Peter 3.18 describes Jesus as just or righteous. And we are to develop His righteousness in our lives. How? Turn your mind to Him. By choice, dwell on the righteous things you should be doing. Moreover, let the Spirit fill you and help you. Let the Spirit command and lead. He'll make the big difference in your life. The world thinks in terms of unrighteousness. Sad but true. If you turn to Galatians, the fifth chapter, you get a dose of that. It says there in the 19th verse of Galatians 5. My carpal tongue is cut off. I can't get the page to turn. The verse says, Now deeds of the flesh are evident which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing. We need to just make sure he doesn't have a fully comprehensive list, so he throws this in. And things like these, <laughs> of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The evil things of this world are not about what the kingdom of God is about. And doing those things puts us outside of the realm of what God wants from his kingdom. And he adds this then, after describing all of the deeds of the flesh, he says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now listen to this. This is what we do when we're spirit-filled and moving away from the worldly way. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. We need to be spirit-filled people so that we can resist what the world brings to us and attacks us with and would hurt us with. We need to dwell in the fruit of the Spirit. We need to think in terms of righteousness, not unrighteousness. We need to avoid self-righteousness, too. There's a lot of folk who've got big doses of that. I almost left Bible college when I when I first got there. I got there and I knew who I was. I was Bill Meyer, center first class. <laughs> Didn't have any question about it. But all those other people, they were so righteous. They had never done anything wrong and they would never do anything wrong. And I got feeling terrible until I stumbled on a few of them doing some things that were as bad or worse than what I was doing. And then I kind of caught on. It was a game. It's called hypocrisy. And I was totally unhappy with that. Because that was not the righteousness of God. That was the righteousness of men. Men who justify themselves. Men who declare themselves to be just exactly right. And from that, they become grossly intolerant of others who don't fit the mold. Who don't look just like they want them to look. We are saved by grace. We cannot do it ourselves. We will never be good enough. God puts some limits on our freedom, but grace, grace, not condoning license, is the thing that we live for. We have biblical restrictions. And God sees not as man sees, the scriptures say in 1 Samuel. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. We must be trained in our hearts to be righteous and to cling to the grace of God that keeps us righteous in Jesus Christ. Jesus, our righteousness, comes by grace. 
He comes through the filling of the Spirit. He comes through us having our mind dwell on these things. One last thing, just as quickly as I can. And I can. I may not, but I will try. We need to focus on purity. Give your attention to purity. The word itself means free from fault, clean, innocent. There's strength in purity, great strength in purity. There isn't much strength at all in a lot of the other things that we depend upon. But there is great strength in purity. If there's a message America needs now, this is it. If there's something that we need to hear and pay attention to, this is it. We went through the Hugh Hefner thing and everybody said, if it feels good, do it. And they're still out there doing it. And it's wrong. Just 10 years ago, 80% of TV programs, when they depicted someone having sex, depicted it as being between two people who were not married to each other. I'm sure it's changed and not for the better. Pornography, how acceptable is it? We bring it into our homes, in our computers, and they sell it everywhere, including for a long time until we came from a bad time, 7-Eleven stores. You could just walk into a store and see all kinds of things like that. Anyone, any age. There is much impurity. Greed is impurity. We see people demanding things for their rights. God never gave us a set of rights. God gave us a set of orders to march to. He gave us the idea that our rights are not that critical. And so we have no right for a woman to say, I have a right to control my own body. That's not your right. God's laws supersede your feelings. And the slaughter of babies that's taken place is another reason that this country is in deep trouble right now. We must abandon selfishness. We must abandon murder. We must abandon impropriety. We haven't the right to be happy. We have an obligation to be true and pure. We need relationships, human relationships that go the second mile, that turn the other cheek, that forfeit one's right <coughs> for the good of others. Above all, we're to be pure, no matter what the personal cause. Until we return to the mores and the Christian worldview that this country was founded on, this country is doomed. It is flat out doomed. I heard two people, preachers, talk about this this past week. I have great respect for both of them. MacArthur, John MacArthur, has stood against closing his church down and paid huge fines, by the way, for that. And he just simply said, America has gone clear downhill morally. And there's a guy named what is it? Graham, that was it. Franklin Graham. And he said exactly in almost the same words what MacArthur did. And I'm saying in the same words the same thing. This country is going down the tubes unless we change. America needs to repent. America needs to change what it's doing. Our society must work on purity. That's what made us great. And an historian wrote that America is great because she is good. If she ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. We need to be careful of the path we're going down. We must not, we must not give in to Satan and the way he's leading us. Our country reminds me of the story of Aaron Burr. He was in Princeton University. They were having a revival on campus. Can you imagine? They were preaching on campus. They were having a revival on campus. 
And he had attended a couple of nights, and the third night he knew that this was going to be the decision. He had to decide about a relationship to God. And late at night, they said the students heard him throw open with a slam his shutters of his room and cry out, Goodbye, God! The echo of that cry is heard throughout our land today. Some with great enthusiasm, I fear. Those of the, of the household of faith are reluctant to admit the sweep and the range of anti-Christian movements. It proceeds in two forms. First of all, there is open, avowed, atheistic propaganda. Sue you in court if you mention the name of Jesus in a public place. It's worship of the non-God. But the second one is the one I want to call to your attention this morning. You who are here, you who are out there on the line, you see there is a dangerous, subtle, cowardly compromise with unbelief on the part of religious leaders and Christians of our day. When religious leaders stand up and give the okay to sin, and say, we want those sinners here at church. Yeah, we do too. But we don't want them here as members. We want them here as people to be converted to Jesus Christ and to serve Him. And we must take a strong stand. And we must at least have the honesty of her and be willing to say, goodbye God, if that's what we're really doing. We must glorify God with our purity. We must glorify God with our hot stance for Him, not a cold or lukewarm one. Christians, arise. Christians, let's go forward. Christians, let's take a stand for Jesus Christ with the way we live, the way we talk. How we need to stand for purity in this land of the impure. second half next week. I pray that God will bless you in this time. We're going to right now partake of the Lord's Supper. Those of you who have, made, who have arranged to have control of the bread and the, the cup Please, let's open those up and let's share together. And you who are out there, I hope you're doing that right along with us. We remember that our purity, our stance in this world, was bought by Jesus Christ on the cross. His body was broken for us, and we take the bread, remembering that. In addition to that, there is the cup, which has even more meaning because it's the blood that he shed. It's representative of his shedding blood, and only through the shedding of blood could we have purity. Only through the shedding of blood could we be right with God. And so we drink this blood of the covenant we have with God. Remembering the purity he blesses us with. I praise God for your sharing together in this service. I'm thankful that we have a God who loves us, reaches out to us, works in us. Don't forget. Don't lose sight of the fact that that one factor, our God being our God, is the most important thing in our lives. Sacrifice anything you must to follow Him. Because He said, if you're going to follow Him, you have to risk your life. Take up your cross and follow Him. Let's take up our crosses as we go out into the world and show the love of God to those who are there.
father we praise you for loving us we praise you for giving christ for us we come to you wanting to examine ourselves wanting to see where we need to take a stronger stand wanting to see what we must do as we look out into this world so lost so deranged by sin bless us father to be light in christ's name amen that concludes our service pray that god will truly bless you We can try it. Which one? Uh, which two do you have? Mm -hmm. Have the list looking at. Let's sing God bless America. I think I'll finish on that note. <laughs>